Have you also experienced how an innocent post on social media blows up into a slamming contest? To shame others and to divide us from them seem like a common pastime in practically every corner of the world these days. I've done it, he's done it, and I'm sure you guys have. The heated debate climate of recent years leads us to think that we live in an extraordinary era. But here's the breaking news of eternity. We're not that unique. Hating and shaming is really yesterday's news. We want to take you on a journey. A journey back in history when we learn how people have constructed the image of their enemies. We'll also explore ancient self-help practices and discover how people have attempted to control their own demonic urges with various degrees of success. Well, let's just say that the, we're lucky that the haters of antiquity did not have social media. Each year, you humans add yet another satanic figure to the demonic pantheon of history. And although demons change appearances in different historical contexts, there, there is continuity to the way we use their mythic legacy to make sense of our world. So why is this important? To better understand ourselves, to better understand our behavior and communication, we must learn how ideas about demons have traveled through history and how they keep stimulating our habits of thought. So why not look further back and let the history of demonization illuminate the darkness of the present? Sounds fun, huh? Some polemical imagery is particularly persistent. Accusations of ritual cannibalism never seemed to go out of style. During antiquity, cannibal was a label popularly applied to the frightening and threatening other. People accused each other of feasting on human flesh. Greeks accused Jews of cannibalism. Jews accused Greeks of ritual murders. Throwing the word cannibal around was so popular that not even the vegetarian Pythagoreans were, same, were safe from cannibal shaming. So what about the Christians? Well, the rite of communion, where they eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Savior, didn't exactly make them appear less suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> According to their opponents, to their opponents, their favorite recipe read as follows. Catch the infant blood, steep your bread in it, eat and enjoy. The horrific tales about ritual cannibalism may seem like a, an extreme example. While it's tempting to think that we're past such polemic imagery today, well, we're not. Conspiracy theories about ritual cannibalism still flourish. And we know all too well how that imagery incites violence. The notion of the cannibalistic Jew is an anti-Semitic all-time favorite. But prominent politicians are also popular targets. Throughout history, the demonic other is constructed as someone eating the forbidden and drinking the disgusting. Cannibalism is a severe cultural taboo. Nevertheless, everyone literally accused everyone of doing it. A bit like a Twitter account close to you. And speaking about Twitter, you want to be my friend on social media. So please make it easy for me. Are you pro or con? Are you righteous or sinful? Save me the trouble of getting to know you and just inbox me the label of your identity. Today, it's so easy to confirm who you are with a simple click. We even communicate our whole complex identity with a few core words under our profile pictures. For our communication channels, we create a polarized debate climate and draw sharp lines between us and them. This is not only a consequence of advancements in digital information and communication technologies. In the centuries before Common Era, 
written messages were scarce, and most people couldn't even read or write. Nevertheless, they organized in small communities and built strong group identities based on their commonality. 2,000 years ago, people speculated about the end of history. Satanic figures were used as rhetorical tools to discredit your opponents in times of political, cultural and religious struggle. The ancient Jewish sect that produced some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they divided humanity into two camps, the children of light and the children of darkness. They themselves were, not surprisingly, the children of light. They sent a clear message to their enemies. Be cursed without mercy for the darkness of your deeds. Be judged in the shadowy place of the everlasting fire. These words were hidden in a cave for 2,000 years that could just as well have flickered by in your feet as yet another smear campaign against a certain group explodes. Are you on the right side? Or will you be damned in the everlasting fire, a.k.a. unfriended on Facebook? <laughs> so we now touched upon the, about the demonic other, but how about the demonic self? We're familiar with it from art, literature, cartoons, and even self-help manuals. That devious little devil that against our better judgment draws us into temptation. Or the frail but gifted artist haunted by inner demons. While this might seem like a modern concept, already during antiquity, people struggle with their inner demons. Plato likens the self to a chariot pulled by a pair of horses. The first horse represents the moral part of the self, the will to do good. The second horse, however, represents the primal passions, aggression, lust, and so on. The charioteer, who represents the rational part of the soul, must attempt to control these two horses, who both pull in different directions. As you may have noticed, the Platonic, the Pl uh, Plato's allegory, um, it, it doesn't have any demons in it. Even though the Platonic passions and impulses are portray portrayed like wild horses, they're not evil. They're just a complex forces of your inner being. Shit you have to deal with, in other words. Later in history, we find a more negative portrayal of people's inner urges. As we have seen, the community that produced some of the Dead Sea Scrolls differentiated between themselves, the children of light, and other people, the children of darkness. But despite their membership in the light club, even a child of light occasionally misbehaved. According to the doctrine of the two spirits, God had placed the spirit of truth and the spirit of injustice inside the human heart to fight. The idea was that these two fighting spirits had been placed there for pedagogic reasons, so that people may understand good and evil and choose their guiding spirit. This solved a theological problem, because it explained why also a righteous child of light could do evil things. In late antiquity, the two-spirit system was developed. Fourth-century theologians needed more spirits or demons to represent the wide variety of human evil. They devised a system with no less than eight in the demons, that each corresponded to a particular sinful emotion. There was a demon of anger, a demon of lust, a demon of pride, and so on. Also, the rabbis explain the human tendency to do wrong with an internal evil impulse. According to the rabbis, you should control that impulse, but you shouldn't exterminate it, since it's also the source of creativity and fruitfulness. Like the children of light, the monks and rabbis of antiquity needed their inner demons to explain why they still had sinful thoughts, despite the dedication to God. 
the monks of antiquity, they developed a whole genre of literature dedicated to self-improvement and strategies to combat the demons. They would work hard, they would fast, and they would sing hymns, everything to control themselves, to keep themselves busy, and to keep the demons at bay. The monks strove towards per perfection and saw the present state as a lesser version of the true potential. With this sort of reasoning, the aim was always slightly out of reach. To be satisfied with yourself was just another indication that you had been doing something wrong and fallen victim to the demon of pride. There's always room for improvement. The work is never done. It sounds distressing, but it does sound a little bit familiar, doesn't it? Like when you finished your fourth or fifth <laughs> self-help manual, and you realize that that fearful demon of procrastination is not gone. <laughs> it has merely adapted to the situation and learned how to make you procrastinate through reading self-help manuals. So, what can we learn about ancient demonization? Well, we're not unique when it comes to dividing us from them. The children of light didn't need Twitter to slam their opponents. All they needed was some passion and some parchment. Not only do we draw sharp lines between us and them, we also misrepresent and exaggerate the flaws of our opponents. Looking at the past from the safe distance of the present allows us, allows us to see the absurdity in our predecessors' characterizations of their enemies. The rhetoric of demonization throughout history teaches us three things. We tend to identify our opponents with the imagery of division to widen the gap between us and them. We create exaggerated images of our opponents, almost portray them like monsters. And third, our uh, understanding of the demonic other never reflects the self-understanding of the other, only our understanding of them. So what can we learn from this? Well, human relations are complicated. Always have been, always will be but we could at least show a little constraint when we describe our opponents. Just because another person votes for a different party does not mean that he or she is an asshole. Or at least not a cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> and what can we conclude about the demonic self? Well, it's surprising how much we can recognize from our predecessors' struggle for self-improvement, like them. We are embarrassed of our shortcomings. The real you is not who you currently are, but who you can become if you just read a little more or eat a little less. Ancient demonology won't help you to exercise your own inner demons, but it might make it a bit easier for you to cope with them. When learning about the anxieties of your predecessors, you're bound to notice some similarities with your own troubled thoughts. And it's always a comfort to know that you're not alone. Well, in fact, you're in very good company. So join the club of eternity. Our message to you is simple. Our era is not unique. We're not that special. And that's a good thing, because that helps us to recognize the ancient patterns of demonic descriptions that appear in our own era and in our own social media. And we can choose to respond to it with self-reflection. We can choose to resist the temptation of demonizing both ourselves and others. Thank, Thank you. you.